small way in this uh, session of uh, the symposium. Uh, my job today is to introduce our moderator, Dr. Angelina Lini, a colleague of mine for many years, and she will also start this morning with a, a prayer. Angelina is a Plains Cree from Sweetgrass First Nation, which is one of the 74 bands in Saskatchewan. And she's a, a fluent Cree uh, speaker with a wide dialect and an associate professor at the First Nations University of Canada and in Indigenous Education uh, for many years. She serves as the program coordinator and she's committed to reclaiming Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous languages. And her teaching areas include epistemology, educational professional studies, land-based education, culturally responsive education, Indigenous pedagogy, curriculum development, and research methods. And if you know anything about First Nations University, you know that uh, the broad title includes many, many tasks and people work very hard to meet the needs of students uh, throughout Saskatchewan. So thank you, Angelina, for participating and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Which means I, I greet you and I shake hands with each of you. I'm happy to be here today to um, moderate this panel on um, the importance of culturally relevant uh, education and uh, to talk about the uh, First Nations University of Canada and higher learning. So I will begin with uh, a short prayer that is similar. And it's um, important to acknowledge spirituality whenever we do things. And uh, it's to be thankful for this day and to ask for prayers for our families, for ourselves. So it is to uh, ask for good relations in all that we do. And so I just want to uh, begin by talking a bit about uh, why First Nations University I listened to the elders and they talked about their vision. The late Isidore Pelche would talk about how they would sit outside. This place was not here yet. They would envision a place where First Nations people would learn about their languages, cultures, languages, traditions. That's why we exist. It was their vision that helped us to be here today. Acknowledge them and give thanks. And it was 2003 that this building was uh, opened. And so, very happy to have uh, four renowned speakers here um, with us. And so, I want to begin with uh, Dr. Blair Stonechild, who was uh, you know, former president at, uh, of SIFC at the time, Saskatchewan Indian Federated College university was called for before, so I'd like to invite him to um, share his thoughts, and he has also written a book, The Loss of Indigenous Eden, and he's written about higher learning. So, thank you all for being here. Prince Edward opened this building in uh, 2003. 
And then a few years later, uh, the Queen herself and Prince Philip uh, visited this building. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, usually when the uh, royalty visits, uh, people come over and present the presents. But uh, on this occasion, it was actually the Queen who brought a present for us. Uh, she brought a piece of stone from Balmoral Public, which uh, it used to be displayed here because it's historic and all, but, uh, you know, the point is uh, recognition of the uh, role of First Nations in helping to uh, support the, uh, you know, the uh, presence of Doing presence of the British in North America. And uh, just, uh, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, uh, my daughter was asking me, you know, what's the big fuss about, uh, about the, uh, the Queen and, and, and the King and stuff? And sort of saying, well, you know, didn't they, didn't they steal our land? <laughs> so I said, basically, what I said is, well, you know, before the British came, uh, we had a beautiful house. Beautiful natural materials, and everybody <coughs> got along, and you know, we were getting along with nature, and, and we were good to the, you know, good to the environment. And then uh, visitors came along, and uh, you know, they uh, showed an interest in the land, and we moved in, we welcomed them, and uh, so we built a house together. And uh, the foundation of the house is the trees. And I said, it's, uh, you know, because she was saying, why don't we just get rid of the barn? And uh, I said, well, you know, that's kind of like, you know, taking the house and ripping out the foundation. And then where do you buy it? Where do you go? So, um, yeah, so certainly, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of important uh, relationship, uh, which I think is also uh, an important relationship with, uh, with uh, you know, for all of us in this uh, country. Anyway, uh, I, uh, as, uh, as Lena mentioned, I uh, am, uh, have written a book which I actually uh, is going to be given out uh, as I give to uh, our uh, speakers at this, this conference and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, presenters. And uh, this is the book here. It's uh, called The Loss of Indigenous Meaning. And uh, in this book, uh, I uh, mentioned to our president uh, when I heard that this. Uh, this uh, session was in the other. I said, you know, I wrote a chapter in this book. I wrote a chapter critiquing the knowledge at universities. And I said that, uh, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's a critique basically of uh, the rational system that's, uh, that's used to engage a reason and rational thinking. And how this was not the way that our elders. Uh, taught us uh, higher knowledge. And uh, we didn't even have uh, our own concept of higher knowledge. And it was actually one of the reasons why this particular university was created. Um, and uh, when this uh, First Nations University was first envisioned, and I guess I can speak with authority because I was actually the first uh, faculty member hired here in 1976. Um, the, um, the elder said, you know, under the treaties, we should have our own uh, institution of higher education where we can teach our own knowledge, you know, how we gain our knowledge and how you know, uh, knowledge is important to us. And so, um, when I first started here, one of the first uh, elders I met was an elder by the name of uh, Ernest Tatuzis who's uh, deceased now. But uh, Ernest used to have a, a thing he liked to talk about. And I remember he was actually uh, interviewed by Roy Bonestero uh, on CBC way back in, in the 70s. And uh, his line was, you know, we indigenous people used to live in the Garden of Eden, and we never abused the gates of the crater. That was his message. And uh, of course, uh, being a residential school survivor didn't quite, uh, you know, didn't quite resonate with me. You know, I was thinking back of all of the things I used to hear at residential school about the Bible and about the Adam and Eve and uh, the Garden of Eden and stuff. And I thought, you know, I thought this guy's been reading the Bible too much. <laughs> but it turns out that he had a far different message, which took me years really to figure 
wrote, you know, what he told me just kind of always stuck in my mind. And uh, so what he really meant was that we had our own way of living uh, in, you know, in the world. And uh, that, uh, that philosophy and way of looking at it came from our elders. What they call the original instructions, which didn't come from the Bible or any textbook, but rather it came from sincere, uh, you know, like praying and asking the supernatural you know, for guidance and information. And interestingly enough, as uh, people who are involved in ceremonies will tell me, people who get answers, and uh, you know, these answers have uh, been passed on through the generations. And the uh, answer basically is that uh, you know, we as, as humans, uh, we are here, we've been given permission by the Creator to be here to experience this physical life in order to learn. Especially uh, to learn how to get along with, uh, you know, call our, our relations with the animals and plants and all the other created beings. Uh, and part of that, that's, the original instructions were simple. It was thankful for this uh, gifts of, for the gifts of creation that we allow to experience and respect them, take care of them, be stewards. Very simple uh, instructions. And so uh, that's what we did. You know, people uh, you know, who came here, of course, who came here said that uh, you know, we were uh, unprogressive, we were uncivilized, you know, we weren't making use of things. Exploiting the environment, but you know what, what I tell uh, my students when they tell me is, you know, we did have an economic policy and we had a social policy. And that economic policy was very simple it was not to destroy the environment, but rather to nurture it, you know, so that future generations would have even more natural resources to grow. That's why there were millions of buffalo. That's why there were you know, millions of basically the passenger pigeons. And uh, so many fishermen you see that in the first uh, explorers uh, explore came here, they get you know, they put a basket in the ocean and come with a you know, whole bunch of fish. So this was our economic policy. But it wasn't understood by those who came here. They thought that, you know, these are all things that, you know, uh, man is entitled to just take and, uh, you know, use for our own you know, economic benefit. Know, for gaining power and for uh, you know, building empires and all that type of stuff. And uh, so, you know, uh, you know they, they told me how to get into a lecture here because I <laughs> So I'll keep it short. Uh, but uh, that's essentially what the book is about. And so, you know, uh, loss of indigenous uh, what I say in the book basically is that. Uh, there was a situation across the world where indigenous peoples existed all over the world, and we all had very similar uh, ideologies and spiritual beliefs, which, had, which connected us very closely to the environment, as well as to the supernatural. And I'll, I'll just leave you with a couple of interesting uh, uh, tidbits of information. Uh, one is, and I actually would like to kind of ask you what you know, what think about the health of the system and the from that thing. So, how long ago has it been since indigenous peoples have been the majority of our population? Well, I did research on that as part of this book, and it turns out that uh, it was only in the 1820s that non indigenous people began to work with the majority of our population. That's only 400 years ago. So that's one interesting thing that, uh, that I found. Uh, another interesting thing was, uh, um, you know, our, the question of our own survival of this. And, um, you know, one of the things which I was interested in was, you know, how long should we be as human beings? How long should we be on Earth as a species? If you want to call us a species, and, you know, we're to look at similar species. And so the answer is, you know, for the survival of the similar species, uh, then we should be on, on the Earth, we should be able to persist on the Earth for a million years. And so we're told by archaeologists and uh, geneticists that uh, you know, uh, modern human species, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, have been here for 20,000 years. So you know, doing some math, we have you know, just uh, we have only another 800,000 years to go. So.
So, um, you know, that's one of the questions I, I ask is, you know, what's our, what's our policy for? Uh, you know, we're so clever, right? What's our policy for surviving for the next 90,000 years? And, uh, of course, I always have that in my saying, well, you know, maybe we should ask the elders. Thank you.
decolonization is going to be even more tough because of what we've just been through. But we've got to understand the journey. And if I can just explain to you in two minutes here, the journey. Picture two canoes going down the river. I'm not trying to teach us the Wampum Treaty of my cousins in the East. I, I, I love, I love their, their analogy and their spiritual connections. That, but just picture two canoes going down the river. At the time of Treaty and Treaty 4, because we're in Treaty 4 right now, the signatory chief, where I am from, Kalosis, this is what he envisioned in 1874. He envisioned two canoes going down the river. One canoe is the Kalosis people, the indigenous people, the rights holders, because indigenous people are not shareholders, not stakeholders, indigenous people are rights holders in this country. And the other canoe was the crown, was European, was Canadians. And the crown canoe was the Western world view, what we all live today. The other canoe was the indigenous world view. And what was supposed to happen was, is we were supposed to flow down this river as long as the sun shines, grass grows, and river flows. Every generation, we were supposed to exchange a child in each canoe to be raised to know the ideology of that canoe and then be given back. We would always change our mandates and, 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 and philosophy based on the social and economic of us together. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Two years after Treaty 4, the Indian Act was thrown in the Kalosis canoe or the Indigenous canoe. And it had one purpose, to imprison the minds of indigenous people. 22 years later, the residential school was thrown in the indigenous canoe. It had one purpose, to brainwash the indigenous people. Today, the canoe kind of fell behind. In 2023, this is what we inherited. And this is why universities are so foundational to getting those canoes aligned up again. Is you gotta know each canoe there is a hybrid, but you must keep them distinct. And that's not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with Western world today. We have our issues, I'm not trying to say they're perfect. <laughs> but we get our mortgages, we get our car loans, we get our, we're protected by the Bank Act of Canada, you know, we're a G7 country. New Canadians are coming here because we're a dreamer country, because of this strong Western world view that we've created over the 170 years. When you look at this from a world perspective. But internally, domestically, we do have work to do. And every institution across this country, university, must understand that indigenous people in the indigenous worldview must be lifted up. We need allies to speak to that. Academics get it. But I'm just uh, 13 days ago, I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> In the political, economic, and even government, there are ceilings to that indigenous worldview. And this is where we remold our minds and reset. And I tell you, it's going to happen. But it's going to not happen sometimes at the pace that we want. But that's the end goal. You know, I brought my six year old with me today. Um, what is the end goal? This is the end goal of what we need on the two canoes. Is right now, my little girl wants to be a pilot one day. She told me she wants to drive a plane. So I told her, absolutely, uh, your mom and I will make you a pilot. So, you know, based on what we all understood and learned yesterday, that indigenous women is the toughest person to be in this country today. Because the indigenous worldview is not lifted high enough yet to understand that relationship and respect. So my wife and I accept that we have to try twice as hard to make my daughter a pilot because of who she is. <coughs> the end goal is, is that when Callie maybe had a daughter one day, she should have tried twice as hard. So we got some work to do. And that's why this conference is important. That's why I'm honored to sit here with these three panelists and our, our moderator. I, said, I come here, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're all my gurus and I get to sit here with you now. I'm so honored. Thank you very much for letting me speak a little bit.
students she just start a letter. You know that word means to stand together, to stand in support. So that's what we uh, talk about. See to start with. They know one word when they leave my class. See to start with. So next I want to um, invite Tammy Rat, who is uh, a lecturer with uh, indigenous languages in our university. And so, uh, I welcome Tammy Brown. You never got the five minutes, no. <laughs> and I'm not Jackie Lawman, President Jackie Lawman. Um, I'm sorry that she couldn't be here to talk to you all today, but I wore my blazer. <laughs> I wish that I wore a colored blazer, because she wears color. She's like great. Um, I'm trying to like think of what she might say to you. Just kidding, I couldn't even. She's amazing. So I'm sorry, I apologize, but um, I do have some good things to say. Um, so Tatsay Tani and C. Kassan, Muscana Kassastaki, Ochimia. Kenny Pinko, Sagi Yunek, Ochi Bia, and Nigawi. Mayo and Moskamesh. This way of Mia. Yeah, so I just wrote so many notes because I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I'm not an academic. I'm, um, I mean, this is me, there's a song I can sing. Okay, this is why I need notes. Um, so, thinking about Indigenous led education, I want to start with a word that uh, Joseph Nantau Pau started us off with um, on Thursday morning. He chi kis in doa mantolukanek, and he explained it. A sacred learning, a sacred space where we're guided. Um, that's the word for university. Um, and he mentioned that Mato was in there. Mato is the word to cry. I never noticed that before, but I did a lot of crying in my undergrad. Um, even during my education interview, I cried, you know, and one of the teachers said you should find a different way to handle stress. <laughs> And here I am better. Um, and, um, and, um, and then an elder said, no, oh, that's perfectly a tangible stress. She's releasing all that um, negative. <coughs> anyway, so, um, all of the beautiful people, um, Blair and Angelina, were my teachers for my undergrad. And I, um, like a three-time high school dropout, and the education system wasn't meant for me. Um, and I didn't have an Indigenous teacher until I entered this building. And I came here because I was pregnant and I didn't want to be a loser to my own child. Um, I went into there and I think my, the first person I met, his name was Joseph. He's my academic advisor. He was my academic advisor through all my university. I never had to make any classes. And all he did was register me for school as a mature student. No questions asked, just registered me. After my first year, I decided I want to be a, want to be a teacher. So, because um, I had these amazing teachers in that first year of university who thought I was smart and gave me really good marks. And I never felt smart or valued, and I still don't feel like I belong here. Um, but I'm here and I'm uh, grateful to be here, and it's because of all the indigenous, ed indigenous educators that um, made me feel like I could be here. And the one thing I wanted to say about Indigenous education is not um, Hello! Oh, I thought I got cut. Cut, you talk too long. Um, indige edu education to Indigenous people, they've been doing it forever. Forever before European education systems existed. Um, and it was successful, right? That's why I think Indigenous people have been around forever. Like, and for so long, and we're still here as um, 
these education systems were successful for indigenous people and for non-indigenous people. Um, we had engineers, we had farmers, we had hunters, we had doctors even. Um, what's his name yesterday? They took so much notes on this one. Michael Strong, Dr. Michael Strong, who said, I want to acknowledge the indigenous people that studied this and before us, you know, like uh, we had doctors, um, teachers. Um, and the more I learned, the more I realized that indigenous people are like the smartest people ever. Because now I'm learning about theoretic frameworks from Mark Spooner. And, um, and there's these theoretic frameworks that I'm like, oh my gosh, this is indigenous research methodologies, you know? And, and now they're continuing to, they're, now they're, now indigenous people are valued. But these things, these, these ideas, these, um, like indigenous epistemology, it, it's all been around since before your, way before your being contact. It's part of our identity. There's just a couple more things I wanted to um, mention. I don't know how, actually how long I have. Or, um, <laughs> I wrote so many notes, so. Okay, so um, one word, a few words I've learned in the past couple years, actually, over the Angelino Haney. And um, one of them is Asunamogwewen, and it's the word that um, it's our responsibility to pass on knowledge that we learned, and that's a word that I, um, I truly believe it's my responsibility. I try to learn every little thing I can just so that I can pass on this knowledge. Um, Ms. Yasso and Askeek is finding oneself on the land, and, um, and I wrote a paper about that. I was going to bring that inside and I get the help just because I think I need fun. <laughs> I've only wrote one paper. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> just like, I got a stamp with my face on it. <laughs> um, and then another word is Miskaswin Nahia Way Minik is finding oneself through Kukrinus, being Cree. Um, and I just think these are, um, these are perfect. Hello. Okay. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> um, and they're all like embedded in, 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 um, in an indigenous, being indigenous, being Cree, you know? And, um, I wanted also, um, I have a quote from Willie Ermine that I used in one of my recent papers that I want to get published. So um, you guys, I'll send you all that, just kidding. So Willie Ermine said that the West Coast system is yeah, okay. Ooh, Aboriginal epistemology and indigenous people forced into something that promotes the dog, the dogma of fragmentation and indelibly harm the capacity of holism. He says it is imperative that our children take up the cause of our languages and cultures because therein lies Aboriginal epistemology, which speaks of holism. Um, and I love, I love this quote. I think um, I had to ask my husband what like all this meant, like dogma and fragmentation, and I was like, holy cow, man, I'm it's a genius. Um, and he knows all these big words. Anyways, um, yeah, so thank you. Um, I love being taught by Indigenous people. They are who make me feel great about myself. I have so much more. I'm going to write a book. <laughs> Administration, 
Lori is an experienced leader in education. Most recently, she was the oldest female player and the only two-spirit person on CBC's first season of Canada's Ultimate Challenge. Through the sharing of her lived experiences, tra traditional knowledge and professional proficiencies, she provides uncomfortable truths required for advancing processes of indigenization, decolonization, and reconciliation within organizations and communities. Lori holds two undergraduate degrees, Indigenous Studies and Psychology, a master's degree in adult education, and is a PhD candidate in social justice education. She currently holds the position of Associate Vice President in the Indigenous Education at the University of Regina. Please welcome her. Yes, for starting the conference off in a good way, and I want to acknowledge any other elders, knowledge keepers, and two spirit people that are in the room with us um, today and have participated in the conference. Um, a lot of what I've been thinking about over the last uh, two and a half days as I've been participating in the, most of the conference as best that I could uh, has just brought about a lot of questions, and I've been observing, um, participating, listening to people. As everybody's been talking, and uh, I also, I, oh, I also wanted to um, thank um, uh, Dr. Yu for the Sita uh, Skatha word. So I, uh, my Korean is, is uh, quite poor, but I do work at it, and um, uh, it was the late Isidore Pelche, Elder Isidore Pelche, who had told me once when I was speaking and, and uh, doing my introduction. Say that it's Kasun and, and uh, um, introducing myself and saying that I felt really awkward doing it. And, and uh, you know, he told me, he said, It's not your shame to bear that you don't know the language. And, and that stuck with me. And so, even though my pronunciation um, is not uh, always good or maybe ever good, um, I just I put that out there and I think it's important. So, for the Indigenous folks um, here, you know, one word at a time, that's what my auntie says. Um, she says one word at a time. And she says, often we'll sit down and have discussion and we'll just take one word and we'll all talk about it. And what does that mean? And Sheila Cody um, spoke about that uh, this week when she was talking about the word truth and uh, breaking it down and looking at all the ways in which the word in our languages, um, all the contributing concepts that go within it. And uh, I think that's a really beautiful thing if you haven't had opportunity to do that. Um, I hope that you do take that opportunity. So um, throughout the conference, I've been thinking about things like, you know, like who is uh, this conference for? Not just what are universities for, but who is this conference for? Who are the people that are here? Who is this panel for? And, you know, when I watched um, uh, Sheila speak the other day, and, and uh, you know, she's a mentor of mine, um, always picks up the phone when I call, and as do uh, so many folks in the room too, and I'm very fortunate to have so many mentors. But I was thinking about, as an Indigenous person, when you're presenting to mixed audiences, um, what people are getting out of it and what they're expecting from me. And as an Indigenous learner, when I'm in the audience, sometimes I find it very challenging. I'll go to a conference and I'll be somebody like Sheila or, or Linda Speak or you know, some amazing Indigenous scholars. And, and as a junior scholar, I want to learn from them. And sometimes I find a conference um, ends up being targeted for the non-Indigenous people. And so as Indigenous leaders, we come in and we speak and we maybe um, find that we're maybe tailoring a little bit to non-Indigenous peoples, um, and that seems to somehow sometimes take the focus of things, rather than focusing on the Indigenous people in the room who might want to be uh, learning and asking questions from us. And even at the end of um, some of the speakers, I noticed who runs to the mics first, and who centers themselves on the mics first, and, 
and uh, a colleague told me, you know, as well that uh, it's, uh, you know, um, shown as respectful to make sure that you're asking questions, you know, after a speaker speaks. But, uh, in, you know, for indigenous people, racialized people, queer people as minorities within the room, um, you know, it might take a moment for us to get our thoughts together before we, before we come up to speak or want to ask a question. Or if we see a lineup of white people at the mic already, we might not get up and ask a question. And it's intimidating um, to get up and ask a question. And uh, I, I um, honor you know, the, the indigenous, young indigenous the folks who have got up and asked questions in sort of the sea of whiteness and, and how challenging um, that can be. And so I thought about that throughout the conference. Like, who, who, is, who is the conference for? And um, who, who gets centered in some, of, in some of the conversations? I also have thought about the conference and, uh, you know, the act of decolonizing and, 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 and my work in general. I mean, you know, this, is, uh, uh, this has been a great conference, by the way. I've loved it. I loved working, you know, a little bit better put alongside Mark to help, um, uh, you know, participate in any way that I, that I can in the conference. But I think these are good questions to ask, you know, like, um, are we, are we um, doing what we're talking about or are we just theorizing about it? Are we theorizing about decolonizing? Are we, um, you know, theorizing about how, you know, indigenous indigeneity should be expressed and supported within institutions, or are we actually doing it? And in a more simpler way, sometimes I think about how, um, at our vigils, we have a lot of vigils, and um, it's important to us that others show up who are not from our communities and who are indigenous. But what I've often said now is what's more important is what are you doing between the vigils? And I feel like sometimes the same thing between conferences is what, what our um, uh, allies, uh, people who are hoping to be allies, doing between the conferences to actually take action. Because writing a paper isn't necessarily the action that we need, right? Um, a, a lot of what we need is to hand over the resources and step back. We know, we know what we can do, we know that we can organize, um, and so sometimes it's not about sort of creating the research project for us, but you know, saying, you know what, there's this great research grant, and uh, I would like to, if there's something you would like to do, I would like to mentor you so that you can actually put a team together and apply for it, and I will just be, you know, the collaborator. Um, and support you in that way. Uh, I think those are some ways in particular um, that we can center in indigeneity within our institutions. I also think, and this is, this is uh, both for indigenous and non-indigenous peoples in the room, but for racialized people, I think we seriously need to think whether you're a student, going to be an employee, whether it's in academia or somewhere else, if somebody is seeking you out and you're applying for a job, I think you need to be asking, what have you done to prepare for me to be here? Why are you seeking me out? And if they can only say because you're indigenous, then that is not the place for you. Because we are more than our indigeneity as well. We're, 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 we're in these institutions, we're educated, we have skills, we, have, we bring our indigeneity with us, um, and it tells you know, the lens through which we experience the world but we also have those same papers, those same degrees, the same um, learning that may not also be the papers, but may be within community or within language-based or mind-based learning. And um, those are valued by some. And, uh, and I think we need to be asking that question. I did ask that question when I had to come and roll back here at the University of Regina. What has the executive table done to prepare to have an indigenous queer um, person at this executive table, and uh, and I did, you know, work to make an informed decision. I know that the University of Regina, uh, I think, probably one of the leaders in having indigenous, a number of indigenous peoples we have on our board of directors, and and I had us being one of them, and, and uh, two others at the time, and that makes the kind of work that I need to do more easy because I'm not fighting my board or my leadership team because we have indigenous 
leaders with expertise, lawyers, uh, you know, politicians, <laughs> ex-politicians, you know, they're at that table, and so I don't, all the work, all the burden is not on me. And for um, students, if you have a scholar, a professor that is um, saying, you know, that they're recruiting Indigenous students or they want you to come, uh, you need to ask them, interview them, it's just as much um, their privilege to work with you as it is for them, for, for, uh, for you to work with, um, for them to work with you as it is for what they want from you. And so, are they prepared, uh, if they're not Indigenous, to, um, to support your unapologetic Indigenous thought and theorizing and dream is theory and story is theory and language is theory and ceremony is theory to do the work that you need to do? Have they set aside and considered within your budget that you may need, you know, uh, extra piece of the budget so that you can go over to the sweat lodge and uh, appropriately compensate, um, you know, your knowledge keepers and elders in order to uh, dream your theory that is going to inform your research. And I think those are important questions. And then for our colleagues who are non-Indigenous who um, are, you know, ready to uplift us in those spaces, uh, you know, there is work to be done. We're not there to teach you. We're not there to break down the door when you come into those positions. I recognize my role as AAP is to do some education. I've taken that on, but certainly not students um, or hiring that indigenous faculty member is not there to teach and uh, advance the careers of their non-indigenous colleagues within the institution. I think that's where I'll end it now, so thank you. Thank you. And so, I think to kind of recap, you know, we all had a journey, much like Tammy was talking about. A journey where we were seeking a place of higher learning and, uh, you know, we wanted that knowledge and it was in a university and, and so now we learn the Western ways of knowing and slowly we started to understand that we also had knowledge and that's why, you know, we, we teach and one of the you know, it's the elders who have shown us the way. And it was, um, I wrote, uh, I read uh, a paper by Lightning in 1992. And he talked about in the indigenous mind. That's what we are talking about, the indigenous thinkers. You know, and the indigenous mind brings in all aspects of our lives, our cultures, traditions, languages. That is what indigenous mind means. So that is what we um, speak about when we teach. And so, you know, we have relied on uh, Western knowledges, Western books. Now we are writing our own books, just like Dr. Stonechild. And there is a, a book that uh, is in the works and it's called Dance Your Style, Pre-Pedagogy. And so it's going to uh, relate, you know, focus on pre-pedagogy. We're not going to rely on anything else but our own knowledges. There is, you know, lots of knowledge that we can draw on. And so that is the place where we're at in terms of um, you know, what are universities for? We have learned from you. <laughs> and we're going to be following that path, you know, to um, reclaim and uh, revitalize, awaken our knowledges and languages. And are there any uh, comments or questions from anybody who would like to ask? Or... I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Linda Smith, who's with us. My... <laughs> yeah, she joined us yesterday in, in our, our board room, and so it was very nice to visit with her. And also, we have a here. So. <laughs>
have joined us today. Are there any other uh, comments from the panel or from the audience? Sorry, one more comment that came to mind is when we're looking at people's CVs um, for advancement, for employment, uh, I think it is important It is important that non-Indigenous peoples um, engage with us, go to workshops, learn, but those pieces should not be used as merit to advance their careers. Because if I put on my resume, a lot of times I've educated white people, I think like, like it would just exponentially build, but we do that and we see that. Sometimes we view that in, in hiring, I've been on hiring committees and you'll view somebody who's a non-Indigenous person as a resume is like, ah, oh, look at all the work they put into learning about Indigenous peoples. You know, look at every Indigenous person in the room and think about all the work that we've done to fight to be here and to thrive here. Service and I get a, yeah, 
can't touch him, you can't tell him what to do, you can only call him as your own. I'm like, this guy's human, right? Like, like, <laughs> So anyway, I'll make it short. Uh, my primary criticism of, uh, of the um, uh, way in which things are approached at the university is basically comes down to the uh, question of the age of reason and rationalism. And uh, the um, saying that I came up with uh, uh, after having done research on this book is that uh, knowledge in the hands of unspiritual people is a very dangerous thing. Now, you know, people thought that the indigenous people were not rational, that they were somehow stupid, but you know what? We have very good minds, and we can figure out very good things. But the thing is, we did not act on any of those until we thought, thought it was spiritually appropriate. You know, to us, spirituality is the highest form of intelligence. You know, it's uh, something that I think you might call wisdom. You know, when I sometimes talk about the thing, people will ask me, well, you know, how can you have indigenous chemistry? And I simply say, well, if we had indigenous chemistry, you know, we wouldn't be putting all of these chemicals to kill people, to kill animals, to kill plants. Right? We're going to simply earn free money. That's the difference between indigenous knowledge and non-indigenous knowledge. And we have all of this stuff that's coming out of universities now. We have artificial intelligence. We've got Lord knows what coming out. You see, this is the stuff that's produced when all you use is, is your reasoning faculties and you don't use your spiritual intelligence. That's the difference. And so that's one of the messages I think that we're trying to get out as a university. This is, this is how we're different, right? And um, uh, that's the message that we have to offer. Spirituality is a very important thing, and that's what's really lacking, to be honest, in a lot of university education. So thank you for that. Thank you. I wasn't writing, but I wrote some notes. I just wanted to say, I thought Katniss. <laughs> Same age. 
But um, I taught him when he was taking three when we were winning. He was so much more mature and like responsible. <laughs> but I always felt that I would take his own because like I want to take credit for how he turned out. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking with Indigenous-led education and what universities are for, um, and I've heard a lot about public good, but I've made a list of things that I I want, you know, in this university as I'm getting my PhD. I I want my my um, my knowledge value. I want to be provided with experiences that ins inspire me, provide me opportunities where I can meet people who inspire me, and I want to believe anything is possible. And I feel that um, the universe, the First Nations University of Regina has like made me believe Indigenous research, you know, Linda, Linda Smith, um, Kathy Absalon, um, um, Audrey Cheever, I just got to spend a semester with her, um, make me believe Anything is possible, so much so that I've applied for a PhD, and and that's not me, you know. That's um, it's like all these these amazing Indigenous people that are um, I'm surrounded by, and um, and that's why Indigenous-led education is so important. Is um, um, like I spent my whole semester in like the art room, like naturally dying you know, and um, I have friends that are like scraping high right now, and they hunted, scraped, and like, um, I truly believe anything is possible, and as a teacher of um, young people, uh, my goal to pass on to any educator is just students, young people, believe that anything is possible.